now. We did a, a flash poll a little bit earlier on. I've got to say that I, I, this conversation came about when I was surrounded by uh, Gaelic football people who were not hurling people, who were complaining about hurling being too good at the moment. That was essentially the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Tommy Rooney, who was a dyed in the wool football man, was like, I just, there's too much score in, in, in hurling. I can't, he, he, just, he wasn't having it. And you also are a um, football mafia person, Owen leading the charge in this one. So let's have that conversation, right? Uh, high scoring hurling, good or bad, says the poll. After Limerick scored 36 points versus Clare and Dublin 231, does the high level of scoring add to the spectacle? Discussion here on uh, OTBAM with Michael Verney, 20 minutes past eight. Let us know your thoughts below. More scores the better, too much ruins the game, doesn't make a difference. Voting closes after Tommy Walsh at 10 past nine this morning. And uh, so we I took that a little bit earlier. I haven't seen the um, results of this yet, but I think this is ridiculous. What, what's the problem with the scoring? It's very noticeable, is the thing. That it is 100% a new trend, and maybe we should be embracing new trends rather than trying to roll back and trying to find whatever that the sport was a few years ago. That it had, it had reached a point of perfection, you feel, in the last decade. The 2010s was the best hurling ever. Now, I think for most sports, things tend to get better the further into the future you go. But is there a sense that the 2010s may lead to a parody of itself in the 2020s. You've, you're looking at the, the records being broken over the course of the weekend. So between Clare and Limerick on Sunday, they notched 59 points between them. That is a new Munster Championship record with a joint total of 60 scores because uh, Clare got a goal as well. The previous record is 56, racked up by Cork and Tip in 2017. Um, Limerick's total then is the second highest all-time championship points total scored by one team. The highest was in a game between Cork and Westmead where Cork scored 40 points last year. This is the sort of score that Limerick put up on Clare, the sort of score that you would expect from an All-Ireland contender up against a promoted team from the Joe McDonough Cup, for example. Is this a good thing? I think it's a good thing if you're a Limerick person. I think it reflects well on their incredible array of scores. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's where the conversation ends. But you also look at the other records that come into play over the course of the weekend. 17 championship scores was the record in one game that was held by Eddie Kerr against Galway in 1972. It was matched at the weekend. I think that might have been well, that might have been an 80-minute game, was it? It was 72, still the 80-minute games. Go on anyway, sorry, yeah. Well, that, that supports the argument. It was matched twice over the course of the weekend. Donald Burke with 116, Tony Kelly with 17 points. Okay, well, look, let me tell everybody that the poll is 37% more scores, the better. 47, too much, ruins the game, and 20% uh, roughly doesn't make a difference. Michael Verney, good morning to you. How are you? Gerald, how are you? Uh, this might be one of those rare occasions where the hurling people and the football mafia are aligned, and they think that there are too many scores, that um, for, for once, the Venn diagram, you're all in the middle. Um, yeah, poss possibly so. Listen, there's, there's probably a lot of factors that came into it at the weekend. Uh, one being like it's it's it was probably something that was naturally going to happen over the years anyway, just with uh, better quality of hurls, probably uh, a lighter ball, which I've kind of said for a good while. This like this has probably been flagged for a while. It's just probably maybe been accelerated a bit more now with the lack of crowds, maybe lack of pressure as well. If you look at the wide count, um, the wide count from even the four competing counties at the weekend, it was very very low. And I know I just think it's probably a bit to do with pressure as well. And there's been a lot less pressure on. There's more of a, an exhibition kind of game feel to it, maybe a challenge game kind of fe uh, feel to it. And if you look at challenge games down through the years, and I played in Manny and played in games where we scored maybe 25 points in a challenge game, and then you might struggle to hit 114 in a championship game. There's just a lot, a lot uh, less pressure on, even uh, even on the on the pitch. Just the, the marking was probably maybe a bit looser than you would have seen before in championship games, where like a lot of the points, maybe even the Tony Kelly came on to they were kind of maybe loose ball where he was running on to ball, whereas in previous championship games that you would have seen with, with big crowds in particular, there's loads and loads of pressure on. There's pressure on every strike. You know, I'd say six or seven of his scores, he was probably not standing by himself, but he had a free shot at goal. There was not even a hurl in front of him or anything like that. So I do think there's probably a good few different things coming into the mix here. The ball, the ball is the one I would have always said, I'm not a good striker of the ball. And if I am able to strike the ball over the bar, from 90 to 100 yards, there's probably a small bit of a problem or something that might maybe needs to be looked at. But it's it's across the board, really. It's not just in Hurling. If you look at 
like the golfers, the golfers, and I know you're both interested in golf. The golfers are absolutely like they're they're going you're like three thirty, three forty yards is you know easy to a lot of them now. Driving par fours, driving par fives, just it, and it's a lot to do with technology. It's in tennis as well. The serving is probably you know as fast and as consistently fast as it's ever been. So it's just a lot to do probably technology, strength and conditioning. And I would say with the with the hurling at the weekend and probably for the remainder of this year, the crowd's not been there, less pressure on. There's probably a less uh, maybe less of a championship feel to it. There's not that pressure even uh, amongst players on the pitch. They're not maybe in on top of each other as much as they would have been. So there's a lot of things kind of coming together here. I think as well, if you look at the start of the Premier League season and the games last weekend, there is just this natural explosion at the start. Defences aren't fully in tune. There is no videotape. Like the the this season is not a continuation of the what happened in February and March. It's an entirely new season, and we've never had a championship after one game or no games in this instance. So I, I actually think you're going to see an explosion of scoring very early on. And I think by the time the All Ireland semi finals and finals come around, there'll be much tighter marking. There'll be much stronger defensive systems in place. I'd be very surprised if there's 31 points scored by the winning team in the Ireland final. But maybe not. I mean, maybe that's exactly what happened this year. I agree with you, Ger. I don't think I would imagine it would be an awful lot tighter. As regards as regards the type of games, whether people kind of like high-scoring games or not, uh, I like the odd high-scoring game, but I do probably prefer... If I was to go back to it, I'd probably look at something like the 2005 Championship and I'd look at, you know, Kilkenny were beaten 5 18 to 418 by Galway, and you know what's widely regarded as you know one of the best games for the last 20 years. Nine goals, 36 points, a great game. And then I don't know if it was a week before or a week after, Cork beat Clare 16 15. And I would take that game every day of the week just because it's so, so much more of a struggle. Uh, and I don't know about G, like I, I watch a lot of kind of snooker, maybe would be one, even golf would be another one. I like you like seeing mistakes. I, I think it's more intriguing probably when lads are making mistakes, when they're missing frees that they should be getting and it's maybe more of a struggle. That's, that's personally the type of game I like in, in nearly any sport because they look nearly more fallible at times. Um, but it, each, each, to, each to their own. Forwards are definitely going to love these high-scoring games as a kind of a miserable cornerback <laughs> in my day. I, I would definitely prefer these kind of low-scoring struggles maybe more so than the high-scoring games. I really enjoyed the Donegal footballers under Jim McGuinness. I, I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was like a complete outlier being injected into the body of Gaelic football and watching everybody wrestle and struggle with that was like... That was high-end sport, as it's supposed to be. And then there's a reaction afterwards and things change and that's how the game moves. So I'd say there's like a good, strong defensive team licking its chops somewhere in the long grass this season going, OK, you, you keep scoring your 31 points, but let's see what it's like when it's put up to you. Talk to us about the ball a bit more, because obviously the yellow ball became a, an off-season story here. The colour of the ball surely doesn't matter, does it? Uh, not not really. It's just, I, th I think a lot of the maybe confusion about it was the fact that, all right, we're two weeks out from championship and the yellow ball has been officially rubber stamped and it's coming in for this year's championship. There was no probably trial of it uh, during league games or anything like that. Maybe some people, some teams maybe would have used it in some uh, some games under lights over the last couple of years just for, for greater visibility. But it is, I suppose it is a fundamental change to something that we've all known in the game. Did it did it matter to me really over the weekend? Not not really. The only thing I will say is the evening game, I found it a bit easier to see in the evening game, which is only natural. Uh, a, luminous, a luminous ball in more maybe in the dark was easier to see than during the game, during the day on Sunday. I didn't find it that easy to see in the first half. But uh, by all accounts, any, any players that I was talking to or any even managers, they seemed happy. The quality of the ball is the exact same. It's essentially just a different colour now. It was just maybe that it was it had been mute, mooted for a while that it was going to come in. It's just that it came in for, for this championship and maybe managers and players only had two or three weeks warning for it. But I don't think it's, 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 not, it's probably not much of a talking point at this stage, I would say. We need to get a big ball, a big bag of those yellow sitters down to Babs Keating this week so we can soak them in a bath of water and we can reduce the scores for the next couple of weeks and everything will be fine. Just one other thing on that, like John Kiley was saying that uh, the ball was in play a lot more on Sunday. Like, I wonder, is, is this a factor? Is this that, like, just the, the quote he says, I think puck outs are an issue because they're coming very fast. Maybe in a stadium where the thing is full, maybe the referees need to buy themselves a little bit more time in those circumstances before they blow the whistle. 
Is that actually a factor in this that, I, I don't know, lads need to be fitter, first of all, because the ball's going to be in play a lot more, but also the unintended consequence of that is that you're going to have a much higher scoreline? Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. Like, there's so many things going on for a referee, you know, particularly you would say in the middle of Crow Park with, with 82,000 people around you. And it does, there's all sorts of pressure that noise and fans and different things can put on you. Uh, now it's just basically, it's just the game. And that's all the players have to focus on. And it's all that the referee has to focus on. Umpires and everything, they have one sole job. There's not really anyone affecting them. So when the ball goes wide, like there's no noise, you know, same when the ball goes over the bar, it could be, it could be a little bit of a din maybe for five or six seconds celebrating the score or whatever. And then the ball is, you know, and we're moving and we're back moving again. Now the ball goes over the bar and it's just like keeper, the key, like Ever Quilligan, Ever Quilligan in goals for Clare the other day. He was ready to go straight away, straight away. There's nothing, there's nothing stopping them now from start, from starting back up again. The referee is generally, as they, it's true, they are a good bit, they are a lot fitter than they were in, in recent years, not in recent years, in the last maybe 20 years. So they're back out in the middle of the field, ready to go again. And the ball is coming out an awful lot quicker. Uh, I don't have the, the stats on it, but I would imagine the ball is in play this year, um, particularly in those two games and even in league football. I'd say the ball is in play a good bit more than it was maybe 10 years ago, where like a keeper can't you know, flick the ball away and try and buy time in the corner now or do these little tricks that they do, all those little kind of things just to buy themselves a bit of time or kill momentum. Like the ball went over the bar, over the Clare bar, I think four times in the first two and a half minutes of the second half, and they were four down, having been level at half time, and there was very little the keeper could do because there's, yeah, the ball just has to, it has to go back and play pretty quickly. There's no excuse for it not to now at this stage, and the crowd and everything like that does kind of feed into that. It does make the game probably a bit slower. Um, so I would say definitely the ball is in play an awful lot more than it would have been in previous years. What will Tipperary have made of that second half performance and that blitz at the start of the second half from Limerick? Are you sitting there as a member of the tip management team going, great, let, let the whole country now think this Limerick team are back to their unstoppable level and that takes a little bit of pressure off us? Or are you like, oh Jesus, these guys are pretty good? <laughs> yeah, well, I would, have been, I would have been one of them last year where I would have said that like, the best team didn't win the All-Ireland last year, for, for me anyway. Uh, I would have had Limerick down as the best team and I still have them as the best team at the moment. So from a, a tip point of view, I don't know if there's ever been less pressure on a team going for back-to-back -back than this year. And I don't know if there's ever been less pressure on a Tipperary team going for back-to-back -back as well. Like, it's 1964-65 since the last did it. One of the big things, like in 2011, a lot of people would say, you know, they didn't respond to the pressure that well. They got back to the All-Ireland Final and were beaten by a brilliant Kilkenny team by four points. And in 17, you know, they didn't back up again and they were beaten in the semi-final by an amazing Joe Canning point by a point. Uh, so, like, what were people talking about at the start of this year? You know, Sheedy, the last three years that Sheedy's been over tip, they've won All-Ireland in 2010. 2019 and sorry the last two years and now he's going for a de facto kind of a three in a row I suppose you could say but like there's no pressure around it and I, I kind of we did a jury in our uh, championship magazine in the independent a couple of weeks ago and Tipperary weren't tipped up once even to win Munster or the All-Ireland and it just like would that have happened in previous years when Tipperary were going for back-to-back -back? no way because a lot of nearly you know, Limerick, there's probably more pressure on Limerick now to get their hands back on Lean than there is on Tipperary to do a back-to-back, -back, which is a strange one. As regards Sheedy, what would he have been looking at the other day? I think definitely one thing they would have looked at was the fact that John Kiley and his management team refused to kind of bend to the way Clare were playing. And that can be both a good thing and a bad thing. So I'd imagine nearly any other team in the country would have had a man-marker on Tony Kelly, a Clare that scored six from play in the first half. Kylie, uh, because he was in the full forward line and maybe with you know a rookie cornerback and a rookie fullback somewhat, didn't want to put a man marker on him, didn't want to put someone following him, maybe where they could take him somewhere, take the player they were on somewhere uncomfortable maybe for them. He went out to the half forward line. Dermot Burns is not a man marker, and Tony Kelly was on him. Tony Kelly got two points. I think Dermot Burns got two points as well. But they would they refused to fundamentally change the structure of their team. Just to um, just to go after you know some other player on the opposition and keep them out of the game. So he didn't want to put a man marker out. Maybe Sean Finn would have been the the obvious kind of example. He didn't want to put him out wing back, and then he's losing his launch pad of one of his half backs, which would be striking you know a long ball capable of scoring, capable of setting up attacks. 
just to negate one of their best players. And I definitely think that's something Sheedy will look at. And I think it's something that even someone like Kilkenny or Galway will look at later on in the year. Where can we put TJ Reid to uh, maybe make it as awkward as possible for Limerick or force them to fundamentally change what they're going to do? And if they're not going to fundamentally change, they could put TJ Reid in corner forward. And if he's not been man-marked, he can loop around and do what Tony Kelly did the other day and make hay. And they have a couple of other... Clear didn't have maybe a couple of other players to t share the load with Kelly. But the likes of Tip definitely will. They have five or six forwards that can really hurt you. So I'd imagine they'll be trying to put maybe Shamey Callan and maybe John McGrath into these situations where they're maybe going to be marking a Barry Nash who's not used to playing cornerback or marking a Dan Morrissey who's not used to playing fullback. So I definitely think... Sheedy will look at the matchups. I think we know what we're going to get from Limerick. We know where they're all going to play. And probably Sheedy will probably look at it and think, how can I best maximise what I have to go against that while kind of putting them in a couple of uncomfortable positions? Like, you can't afford to leave Seamus Callan and score, you know, a couple of goals and then have John McGrath and Bubbles and Bonner Matter and a couple of other lads chipping in. Claire didn't have anyone to chip in with Tony Kelly the other day, but Tip will be a different prospect altogether. Yeah, that's... It, it, go on now, I'm sorry. Well, sorry, yeah, it just does seem that not only do you have more options in the Tipperary and the Kilkenny forward ranks, you've got more physicality as well. Like, I mean, Tony Kelly's help the other day was Shane O'Donnell. Uh, like, uh, as good a hurler as he is, a more physical presence in that full forward line, like a John Conlon would have had a far better chance of getting any change off that Limerick team, who are just a team of man mountains at this point, and they seem to have got bigger over lockdown. Uh, how big a factor is that going up against uh, a big full forward line or even a big half forward line and just trying to beat Limerick up front with brute physicality? Yeah, from 5 to 12, they're absolutely huge. Now, so a couple of the full back players probably a bit smaller and even in the full forward line, the likes of Graham Mulcahy, like Aaron Galan would be probably what you would class as maybe smaller players, but that's in comparison to Grode Hegarty and these lads. When Kilkenny took them on last year, they're, they took them on, they tried to take down that pillar of the half-back line and the half-forward line, and they did it unbelievably well. And it requires, like, a Walter Walsh playing wing forward who's going to be, like, a wrecking ball and who's going to, you know, basically put Hegarty and these guys on the back foot and physically match them, or at least match them. They have to at least match them or overpower them. It took an Adrian Mullins kind of to do that as well. John Donnelly last year as well. So I think if you're going to take Limerick down, you know what you know what they're going to get. You know the half forwards are going to pull out. You're just going to try to have to match them physically in that kind of sector, particularly in their half forward. And look at their half forward the other day, scored 12 points from play. So it'll be interesting to see what way what way they do it last year in the Munster final. Kyle Hayes pulled out. Uh, I think Park Matter was centre back that day. He pulled out you know 100 yards from goal. Was picking up ball. And Park Matter didn't see the amount of ball that he normally would. It'd be interesting to see what way Lim or what way Tip go with their backs um, on Sunday. Brendan Matter picked up Aaron Galan the last day in a kind of a man marking job when they hurled him in the Munster final last year and was out of position. He was brilliant. But it'd be interesting to see will he play wing back? Will they try and go toe to toe with these these kind of three physical brutes in that in the half hour line? And I think kind of Kilkenny set the template last year. It was just this constant, the half forwards and the centre forward, constant work up and down the line, up and down the line, and just kind of spoiling those guys, who Hegarty and Hayes and Morrissey, who they, they, they sit so deep and they're, they're kind of auxiliary halfbacks almost, but then they're able to get up and have the, the strength and condition, I suppose, to get up and be able to play in the forwards as well when they're attacking. So I think if you're going to take Limerick down, you're going to have to at least match them, um, match their half hour line. I think that's kind of their pillar at the moment. Like a lot of people would say that like, their half backs aren't necessarily defenders. Like Tony Kelly got a couple of points the other day. Uh, Dermot Burns is probably more focused on going forward and getting the ball going forward. Maybe you could say the same about Hannon and probably to a less extent Paddy O'Loughlin as well. But the half forwards are the guys that come back and actually defend for them, and probably Will O'Donoghue uh, in midfield as well. So you've got to create. You're going to have to match them from five to twelve, and probably Tipperary do have a fair few physical brutes, the likes of Michael Breen, Dan McCormack, probably Bonner Matter, that probably could match them in those sector. So, so I don't, I don't expect anything like that sort of high-scoring game that we had last Sunday. I'd, you'd be, I'd be more like maybe 21 or 22 scores each when the two of them meet, because I just think it's going to be an awful lot tighter around that middle sector. And tip to get a load of goals? Uh, well, they're definitely going to go after the Limerick full-back line anyway. They're definitely going to try and get ball in there as quick as, as you can. Like They don't have that same versatility in the full-back line now. Dan Morrissey is full-back, having played wing-back probably all his career. 
they're not going to probably put him out to cornerback. They can't move him out to cornerback like they would with a Mike Casey. They can't move a Barry Nash from cornerback into fullback, maybe like they would with a Sean Finn or a Richie English. So I definitely think you're probably going to see a fairly stacked, uh, a fairly stacked Tipperary full forward line, and they have the players where they could they, they could stack their full forward line with Callan at 14, John McGrath at 13, and maybe Bubbles at 15, and. Uh, that would be a really, really interesting prospect. I like it'd be amazed if they don't try and go after that full back line. Just on Saturday night's game, then I guess it's impossible to not look at Dublin without the context of Kilkenny coming up this weekend. But that Donald Burke performance was unbelievable, Michael. It just shows what they've been missing, especially last season without him. Is it going to be a Tony Kelly situation though, where if you stop Donald Burke, you stop the dubs? No, not not as much, John. I don't think. No, he obviously chipped him at one sixteen the other day. Um, this would have been well flagged from you know a couple of years ago. He's been brilliant with DCU. He's been brilliant with Dublin when he was in there as well. And just the fact that he wasn't obviously around for last summer. He spent the summer hurling in America, I believe. Um, he's a ma he's a massive massive talent. Uh, when he gets the ball, this was how quick he how quick he's able to quick he's able to strike. You think you're in on top of him, and all of a sudden the ball has gone over the bar. He's a he's a lovely forward. The only thing I will say is. <laughs> that goal he got the last day, I don't think he would have reached the twenty-one yard line against Kilkenny. He would have been left into the middle of next week. And he like he just he just he just wouldn't. Like you telling me Parik Walsh or Hugh Lawler or Paddy Deegan or one of these guys aren't just gonna put up a roadblock there. They de they definitely will. Uh but they he, like they brought on Mark Shute the other night, they brought on Liam Rush, they brought on uh Eamon Trolley or Dylan as well. They have subs to come in. Um Danny Sutcliffe not back to himself or back to 30, 2013 form, but definitely probably offered a bit more than he than he was than he was last year. I think Ronan Hayes inside is a, a great talent as well, very very strong in the air too. So I do think they've a, they've a bit more they've a bit more just than Burke, and I think they have good backup if they needed. Like they can bring in Dylan after twenty minutes if they needed. Mark Shute can definitely turn the game, and we've seen Liam Rush a full forward before as well. So they they have kind of options. I think Matty Kenny probably realised that. There was probably maybe an over reliance on the likes of we'll probably see Colin Keeney in the twenty six as well, maybe David Tracy too. Probably thought there was an over reliance on them last year that maybe like a thirty seven or thirty eight year old that they shouldn't have to be relying on him. So he brought in a few new faces and now they have the experience coming off the line. Um which is definitely gonna be interesting. I, I don't see them beating Kilkenny personally, um, but I do think it'd be an interesting one going into the two games this weekend. How much uh, of a benefit will Dublin having a game under the belts be and same with Limerick coming in against Tipperary how much of a benefit will that be uh, I know from playing myself that I'd always prefer to have a game under my belt and take away that kind of bit of freshness you can almost be too fresh so I think that will definitely benefit Limerick and it will benefit Dublin um, I don't see Dublin beating Kilkenny I think it would be an interest, a very very interesting game I just think Kilkenny will have too much up the other end between TJ, Colin Fenley, and I think Owen Cody is a fair shout to start and shout to start, and he's been brilliant um, in challenge games recently. I think he scored three five against Clare in a recent challenge game. So they've got loads of options. You throw in Richie Hogan, John Donnelly, Walter Walsh, uh, Connor Fogarty, Killian Buckley is kind of coming back from a thumb injury now as well. Kilkenny have slowly uh, developed this big big panel again. They have Billy Ryan inside in the forward line too. And they're definitely going to be there or thereabouts. If Dublin were to beat them, it'd be a massive uh, statement of intent. But I, I don't see it, even though I think it'll be a very interesting game. And Galway, Wexford, very interested too. And then Tip and Limerick as well. It's um, some bonanza of a weekend ahead. It's like uh, all Ireland's hurling semi final weekend, except uh, everybody gets a second bite of it as well. So um, plenty going on. Michael, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks a million. Cheers, guys.